the CNBC app. Global market news in one place. Customizable sections and personalized alerts. Stocks tracking, interactive charts and market insights all in your hands. Stay connected. Stay informed. Download the CNBC app today. Welcome to Sportbox. Here are your headlines today. Dovish minutes from the Federal Reserve and a dramatic revision lower in payrolls data reinforce expectations the Fed will cut rates next month. U.S. equities rebound with the S&P 500 hitting its highest level in five weeks as market attention turns firmly to Fed Chair Jerome Powell's speech at Jackson Hole. Target topping Wall Street forecasts sending shares 11% higher. That comes as Americans double down on discounts amid continued price pressures. We've seen a pretty steady consumer environment. I think part of it is we still have a very strong labor market. But a consumer who's managing their budget carefully, they're looking for value. Tim Walls ex- accepts the Democratic Party's nomination for vice president, rallying supporters at the DNC in Chicago. We're on offense and we've got the ball. We're driving down the field. And boy, do we have the right team. Kamala Harris is top. Kamala Harris is experienced and Kamala Harris is ready. Pivotal day for markets yesterday. Don't forget there's been some concerns out there that the Fed might be behind the curve when it comes to cutting interest rates, that we've had some weakness in the data. The Fed is still sounding a little bit hawkish. I think some of those concerns got parked yesterday as the minutes crossed. And the view really from that commentary was that some of the Fed voters are already there in terms of rate cuts, yep. that if one had been proposed in July, some of them might have supported it. The fact that we're on course now for a September seems to have been the messaging that has hit the tape yesterday. I wonder why there wasn't a little bit of panic yesterday and and I only say that not because I believe that there should have been but it's a similar notion that we got when the July payrolls data came out right you had the revisions to NFP showing over 800,000 jobs being uh, actually uh, undercounted essentially in in this regard or overcounted should I say actually and then at the same time you still have the Fed saying well we we're, we're, we're almost confident then that the conditions are the same then and even saying many participants noted that reducing policy restraint too late or too little could risk unduly weakening economic activity or employment. And when you start saying things like that, does that not give off the same sentiment as, the, as those jobs numbers, the NFP numbers that we were so worried about that created so much havoc in the market? Well, there was a little word, too, in the minutes which suggests that the Fed officials were not caught off guard by the change in payrolls, uh, effectively saying that the payroll gains might be overstated, which means the economy might not need to add as many new positions each month yeah. to keep the jobless rate steady. So I think the, the fact that the Fed was well aware that there could be some anomalies in the data, and as this hit, they were spot on. So I think perhaps that provided the sense of calm, but there might have been concerns around a growth scare again. Yeah, no, yeah, I wonder then what does this mean then? That is this a case of being too data dependent has now led them to the fact that when the data then finally hits, you are a little bit behind the curve. Yeah, well, let's get into the weeds on this. As the Federal Reserve is on track for a September rate cut. That's according to the latest FOMC minutes from the July meeting, which pointed to a, quote, vast majority of officials seeing such a move as likely. The minutes go on to state that some members would have backed a cut at the July meeting. Ultimately, all voted to stand pat until after the summer. The U.S. revised down its 12-month payroll figure <clears throat> through March by more than 800,000. Its largest downward revision since 2009. The latest preliminary NFP revisions by the Labor Department found job growth was actually 30% lower than first reported. The updated print points towards a weaker than expected jobs market, potentially giving the Fed further impetus to begin cutting rates. Now, for investors, it is not a question of if the Fed cuts next month. It's a question of how much. Markets are now pricing in a roughly two-thirds chance of a 25 basis point cut in September and a one in three chance the Fed goes for 50. This all ahead of the Fed's Jackson Hole Summit, which kicks off today. CNBC's Steve Leesman will be on the ground speaking to an array of Fed officials, including the Kansas City Fed President Jeff Schmidt 
and the Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker, this ahead of Chair Jerome Powell's keynote speech on Friday. Let's get to Stephen Blitz, who is Chief U.S. Economist T.S. Lombard. Stephen, I think a lot of us are just reading between the lines of those minutes, looking at the data revisions too as we are watching the payrolls. What did you make of some of the commentary that seemed to be quite dovish in the minutes? Yeah, I think the most the thing that really came out to me that came across on the minutes, uh, obviously the cutting in, in September, and if the data is really bad, they'll cut fifty. But I think what really struck me when you compare their assessment of monetary policy in relationship to the economy and inflation or labor and inflation, uh, six weeks before they were in a good place and it was able to handle whatever comes next. And there was a tremendous amount of uncertainty in these minutes uh, as to whether or not they should have begun to cut, maybe they will cut. And this uncertainty tells me that A, they're going to cut, but that they are themselves beginning to get a little concerned that uh, uh, that they, they might be a little bit behind the curve. Because as, as, as you just said on the broadcast, the problem with the data dependent policy is that once you see the de weak data, you're too late, right? And you have to assess that. And uh, they clearly have moved towards much less certainty about whether or not policy is in the right spot. And if I could just go on for one second, because you talked about the data revisions. Um, there's nothing like getting looking backwards and say, well, there was 800,000 fewer workers, okay, um, but the economy grew the same, consumption grew the same, uh, income grew the same, none of that gets revised differently. Uh, so clearly we we're able to grow 2.8% in the second quarter with 800,000 fewer workers. So let's keep that in mind. Where this number matters to the Fed going forward, is that what the revision says, okay, is that the ongoing birth, death, death estimate that the uh, BLS runs, in other words, their net anticipation of new businesses that they can't, uh, they can't go out and uh, survey because they don't know they exist, mm -hmm. towards the end of cycles, that adjustment or that anticipation of newer, jo newer jobs uh, from new businesses is really now way off the mark. Right. And this generally happens just before recession. Right. And it means that the Fed policy is crimping the ability of the economy to create new jobs through new business. Right, Stephen. But let me just bring up the notion of a recession because it was a couple of years ago at Jackson Hole where effectively Jay Powell was uh, happy to take the economy into recession if he had to. This is the Volcker characteristics that the market was looking for from just about every central bank. And he was willing to tip the economy into recession to tackle inflation. Are you now saying that the inflation story is done? It's yesterday's news. Yeah, and I, I, I was, over six months ago, I said that you know, it, it, employment was now the, the driving force, and it is. I'm smiling because he was never going to tip this economy into a recession. He doesn't have the bandwidth uh, like Volcker did uh, from Congress to do just that. Recession's not an option. They run their whole tightening policy that way. Um, and, you know, the rock of the hard place that they're in right now is that Yes, employment's the problem. We're not in recession right now. I want to be very clear about that. So this is all anticipatory, but that's the whole art of monetary policy, right? And so they're going to ease and hope that they aren't too late. The problem is, going into 2025, is that at this point in the cycle, historically, the economy has an overhang of debt because business and consumers have spent and borrowed, et cetera. This time, you don't have that overhang of debt, but you do have an overhang of liquidity. And so what happens is you ease to prevent recession. That liquidity, which is all stored up now in money funds, et cetera, start letting loose. And, uh, and, and, they, and, and that money starts getting spent in asset markets and houses, whatever it is. That's a 2025 story, clearly. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons I think why they've been reluctant. They don't want a recession, but they're reluctant to be too aggressive on the easing yeah. side because they know that's coming. Yeah, Stephen, I mean, if, if a recession is not an option, then will the consumer spend enough to keep the soft landing that uh, the Fed has in sight? Or will it also be a case of, of course, with the government spending as well also in play here? Will that be enough? Enough to prevent recession? Yep. Um, yeah, no, they have to ease. I mean, you know, you never know where or how a recession is going to start. And it's usually a shock to the system, you know, ends with a bang, now with a whimper and all that kind of stuff. Um, And that's it's going to be true here, too. But if I'm sitting in a three percent inflation world, one and a half less than that, if I'm looking at it from a rolling three month basis and short term money is at five and a half right? That's too high. And if I'm a business bought using commercial paper to carry inventory, in the last few months, goods prices, X food and energy, according to CPI, fell almost 2% on an annualized basis. And I'm paying 5.5% or more, given a credit spread, to carry that inventory. At some point, I'm going to start cutting back. And at the same time, as if if the economy slows to 90, 100,000 private sector jobs a month, consumer spending is going to flatten out. And that's how you, you know, that's the classic way in which you would generate, you know, a slowdown. Yeah. Stephen, we appreciate your points. Thank you so much for weighing in today. Stephen Blitz, Chief U.S. Economist, T.S. Lombard, are setting us up nicely for what lies ahead this week. A reminder that our Jackson Hole coverage kicks off today with Kansas City Fed President Jeff Schmidt and Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker will be on the channel. Arabile. Well, focus turns, of course, to that. Then Jackson Hole proceedings are kicking off then today. We'll unpack that. It looks like the market could be returning to some downside then as we head towards the U.S. market open a little bit later on, of course, with the weekly jobless claims data also still in focus then. Market still looking towards more data as we unpack this market movement. But what happened yesterday? Well, we were back to black then. We found ourselves managing to gain half a percent then for the Nasdaq uh, in yesterday's trading. Of course, the July Fed minutes being very key to how exactly the market took on what was anticipated risk then, or perhaps a cut in the uh, Fed uh, rates then anticipated to come through in September. Our question mark would be whether it's 25 or 50. It almost looks like a sure thing that a cut will be in place. It's just how big that will be. That perhaps may be a key question mark, because does 50 indicate that a lot more is wrong with the economy, or is it a case of just having to do it because you're just too restrictive at these levels? So market managing to move a little bit higher, but as you saw in the futures, we could still have a down day today. On the Treasury front, then yields dipped yesterday after the release of those very same July Fed minutes, because it looks like markets could be heading or cuts could be in play here. You're seeing the 10-year note now at 3.79, having dipped towards 3.77 actually in yesterday's trade. The two-year note still firmly below that 4% mark, 3.92 and a bit on that one. On the dollar crosses here, the dollar is pinned close to that one-year low, particularly versus sterling and the euro then as well. Again, those Fed minutes still coming into play yesterday. Today, a bit of an ease off from that still. Uh, 130.80 is the mark there for sterling against dollar euro. 111 uh, 42 in fact there uh, very interesting it is sh- just shy of its highest since the middle of last year uh, is euro dollar right now which would have been 111.71 there dollar yen then back, uh, just above that 145 mark is where we're seeing it this morning and on to the commodities here very quickly crude oil lower recent sharp sell-off has however paused though uh, after expectations of a fed rate cut wti having even touched what is its lowest since early February uh, in yesterday's trading. Gold prices also drifted lower, but still firmly above that 2,500 mark, a fourth 
uh, four tenths of a percent weaker so far. And the Asian market this morning then mostly higher investors assessing some of the uh, data then to come out particularly out of the likes of Japan then particularly business activity numbers then uh, in the area. You are seeing again a four tenths of a percent for both the Hang Seng as well as the Nikkei or the Shanghai Composite is in negative territory but is really only just uh, in that mark. The Bank of Korea also deciding to keep its benchmark rate unchanged at these levels, 3.5% in line with expectations, Karen. A couple of stocks on the move. Target closed more than 11% higher after the retailer posted a 3% rise in sales in the second quarter, beating Wall Street's expectations. The discounter also raised its full-year profit guidance, but warns sales are likely to come in at the lower end of its range. Macy's also beat expectations but cut its full-year sales forecast as it struggles to attract customers to its department stores. The company now expects comparable sales to fall between 0.5 and 2%. The Target CEO, Brian Cornell, said he is optimistic about the strength of the consumer. We continue to see an incredibly resilient consumer. Now, they've been facing the pressure of inflation and rising interest rates. They're continuing to look for value. But we've seen a pretty steady consumer environment. I think part of it is we still have a very strong labor market. But a consumer who's managing their budget carefully, they're looking for value and we're delivering value right now. Now ahead on the show, Vice Presidential nominee Tim Waltz prom promises to leave it all on the field as he rallies Democrats ahead of November's vote. Also ahead, shares in Swiss eyewear company Alcon closed down over 2% yesterday. After posting a miss on second quarter sales, we'll be hearing from the CEO that comes up after the break. And coming up, We'll also speak to Aegon CEO Lard Fries, who, as the Dutch insurer, beats expectations for its key capital generation metric. CNBC Connect is back in Bangkok, Thailand. Join the world's top entrepreneurs and C-suite executives for an invite-only leadership retreat. On the agenda, hiring innovation and growth in Asia. Is AI transforming industries and creating opportunities? And get insights on building sustainable and resilient businesses. Be part of Managing Asia Live. Network and join an interactive brainstorm session. CNBC Connect, hiring innovation and growth in Asia. On September 4, register now. Now, insurer Aegon topped expectations for operating capital generation in the first half, coming in at 588 million euros. Lard Fries is the CEO of Aegon and joins us now. Lard, thank you so much for the time. Appreciate it. I mean, uh, you do have that operating result decrease by, up by 8%, a net loss here of 65 million euros. But as we just noted then, it's that operating capital generation that you in expect to be on track to meet your guidance for the year. Won't you just run us through the half? Yeah, good morning, Karen and Arivile, and thanks for having me back on the show again. Uh, we are very pleased to report this morning a <clears throat> strong set of half-year results. Our commercial momentum, especially in the United States, across all product lines has remained very strong. We see the same happening in Brazil and in our workplace business in the UK. There's also some softer spots, uh, especially in China, life insurance, and in Spain, for instance. But the star of the show of this half year has been our asset management business, which um, saw outflows last year. And in this half year, eight billion of new inflows on the back of new clients onboarding in the Netherlands, in the United Kingdom, uh, money market inflows in China, and our partnership with uh, ASR in the Netherlands. So overall, we are very pleased with those results. Our capital position of the operating units is well above their operating levels. Our cash capital position at the holding company is very strong, which uh, allows us to um, announce today a 14% increase of the interim dividend um, uh, per share, which we believe is, um, is, a, is a good proof testament that the strategy that we are implementing for the last couple of years is truly coming to fruition. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about that UK transformation that uh, you, you've also uh, put in place. Are you seeing further improvement then in your, in your business there? It has been a spot that was a little bit weak as well in that first quarter. 
Well, if we look at our UK business, the workplace business is really doing very well. Uh, actually, this quarter we're seeing a record uh, net deposits of 1.7 billion, which is a continuation of a trend in the workplace pension market that we're seeing for already quite a number of quarters for our business. Uh, the uh, advisor platform, which is the other piece of our business, is still impacted by subdued consumer confidence uh, and investor confidence uh, in the United Kingdom and an ongoing uh, consolidation in the non-target advisor market, which uh, which is also uh, uh, impacting that. But overall, I would say that the commercial momentum in the workplace business, particularly in the UK, is very strong. Recently, we had our capital markets teach-in event about the UK strategy, where we have laid out our plans to transform our UK business in the coming years and investing in it to ensure that we capture the opportunities of a continuing growing wealth management market in the UK. Lud, let me ask you about the U.S. business uh, because uh, in the report today you talk about the, the offset here of a fair loss, uh, fair value losses in the United States. We knew at the trading update that there might be some lumpiness here as you refocus strategy. Just explain how those changes are playing out and what lies ahead. We indeed had some fair value adjustments, which is actually a non-cash item, um, but and that has fluctuations that you can see happening more often in quarters. The most important thing for today is indeed uh, an assumption update that we did for our mortality. Uh, we usually do that uh, in the second quarter of the year if we review our assumptions. Uh, and over the last number of quarters, we saw elevated uh, mortality experience in our results, and we felt it only appropriate uh, to go back to our models and update them. Uh, we took a 400 million charge for that um, uh, this quarter. Uh, and, but the good news is that moving forward, we expect the operating result as a result of this assumption update uh, to increase. Lad, I want to ask you about the third-party deposits, uh, the inflows here, because we've had market turbulence just in recent weeks. Uh, market sort of aggressively, as you know, then bounced back, but lying ahead, some concerns around the macro. What impact do you think this is going to have to some of the confidence you've been seeing in the business so far? Well, we've seen in the last couple of weeks, indeed, some volatility in the markets. Um, if you look at our hedge platforms, they have performed very well. We are used to managing our assets and liabilities in such a manner that in all scenarios, our clients' money is safe. And our hedge effectiveness was 99% as we reported today. Um, so we've got good derivative platforms in place to, uh, to shield ourselves from this uh, temporary volatility. The overall market in the markets where we are operating, I would say, is um, the, the economy, the state of the economy is more a matter of cooling down rather than collapsing, especially in the U.S. where we still see strong uh, the, the economy being very resilient. It will now especially, of course, be important to note what will happen with interest rates. Uh, the policy rate cycle, as we know, in the U.S. is at its peak. Uh, we expect in the coming weeks, based on new data that we hopefully are going to support that, uh, right. an easing of the rate cycle to, over time, more neutral levels. Yes. Uh, the economy itself remains strong, and we see that resilience back in the commercial momentum um, that we have across our, uh, across our markets. Right. Large. Let me just squeeze in a quick question on the politics and whether you are concerned about any changes here because the Labour government and everybody's looking at whether Rachel Reeves could actually change inheritance tax, capital gains tax in uh, the autumn budget. Also, whether there's going to be a pensions review that brings changes. What sort of policy initiatives are you looking for and what are you concerned about at this stage? The uh, American, um, uh, the American democracy is a vibrant democracy, and uh, the and then the American citizens will go in to elect their new president. Over the last decades, the many decades that we have our business Trans America in the U.S., we've held very constructive relationships with governments uh, from either side of the aisle, administrations from either side of the aisle. Obviously, what we would be looking for is increasing access to retirement uh, planning, which has been. Um, I think increasing over the last number of years in the United States because of the Secure Act One and Secure Act Two, but we aim we we find it very very important that more and more people have easy access to retirement planning and that there are incentives in place for uh, smaller and medium-sized and larger companies to truly help their employees build up their pension plans for the future. The, on average, still the retirement money, the pot of money per average retail household in the U.S. is, re is quite low, quite frankly. So there's much more to be done uh, to plan ahead.
Lard, thank you very much. And we hope that much. regulation will support that. Right. Lard, thank you so much for taking the questions today and talking us through the numbers. Lard Frise with us, the CEO of Aircon. Well, Swiss eye care company Elcon has posted a miss on second quarter sales after weaker than expected performance in its key segments. However, the firm maintained its four-year outlook, saying it is focused on new product launches this year and beyond. The Elcon CEO, David Endicott, told CNBC he expects healthy consumer trends ahead. We were very pleased with the second quarter directionally because there was real rebound in the intraocular lens implant business. And so, you know, from our point of view, um, while there were some changes in the income number because of a one-time supplier impact, um, which affected gross margin and obviously, you know, didn't uh, give us the kind of lift we'd wanted on earnings, we had very good revenue and underlying demand from that. So, you know, we had a one cent beat. We probably would have been six cent beat on that. Um, so I think there's a little bit of noise in there. And then the revenue number, again, I think there was a little bit of a softer U.S. market this time. And so, you know, we see that, you know, affecting a little bit of our consumables business in surgical. And we see a little bit of that, um, you know, affecting the implantables as well. But I think, you know, directionally, we felt like the underlying demand, our share, the penetration of these markets has gone really well. Right. And that actually leads me to my next point on the guidance. You're keeping it. You did not change guidance for the time being. However, some analysts are looking at that and they were quite surprised really with that decision, given that there's some challenges for the sector overall. So just explain to us what made you confident at this stage to keep guidance. Well, first of all, we're, we're having, as I said, we have really strong underlying demand. We're making good progress on penetration of IOLs in uh, the advanced technology area. And I think directionally for the rest of the year, we expect normal markets. So, I mean, we've been encouraged by the consumer, um, you know, our view on our contact lens business. We had a very good contact lens number. I think it was nine or 10% uh, against a market that was, you know, still grew 6%. So, you know, it, the consumer seems healthy for the rest of the year. The markets seem to be solid. And so we feel like, you know, there's a lot that can happen between here and the end of the year. And we've got a lot of levers to pull. Talking about uh, the, the softening that we're seeing in terms of uh, uh, the performance in the United States, just explain to us perhaps how you're preparing the business for the rest of the year in that part of, uh, of the world. Well, really, we're not changing much. I mean, as we kind of look at the rest of the year, we expect normal markets, you know, for our surgical business. So we're, you know, we're going uh, strong at uh, our existing products, but also preparing new product flow for next year. We have about five, six new products, uh, many of which are in our surgical business uh, that we're excited about. And so we are beginning to invest in those. We're going to continue to uh, to push forward that way. I think on our vision care business, um, again, we've got some new product flow in our Precision 7, which is a new one-week lens. Um, again, we're getting prepared for that. So rest of the year for us is, you know, let's finish strong and let's get prepared for next year. Thank you for listening to Squawk Box Europe Express. For more market-moving news, you can head to cnbc.com. Or join us again on the show with Steve Sedgwick, Karen Cho, and myself, Arabi Lekomete, weekdays on CNBC.